biology or types of flower setups that a seed plant can have. Number one is this is the these are the female parts, the pink. If it has the female parts and the male parts, the red anthers are the male parts. If it has female parts and male parts in the same flower, this is um, called a perfect flower. Perfect. These are also, um, so these are hermaphroditic, or they're also called bisexual flowers. The scientific name for these is, um, I don't want you to remember the scientific name, but the meaning of it is interesting. It's monoclinus, which means one bed. Yeah. Okay. These guys, you can also have female flowers and male flowers on the same plant, right? These, all the rest of them are imperfect from here down. This type of imperfect flower setup is called monoecious, which means same house or one house. And then the third setup is to have male plants and female plants. If you have male plants and female plants that are separate, this is dioecious, which means, did anybody guess? Two houses. So, so if they're perfect, generally we call these selfers. Generally, perfect flowers will self-pollinate or self-pollinating flowers because the male and female parts are so close together. These guys down here, if they're not, if they're imperfect flowers, we call it outcrossers, because they can combine with a different, you know, genetic line. Uh, when you have the selfers, they're gonna self-pollinate pretty easily, so you're, they're not as dependent on pollinators. But when you have these, you need to move the pollen from the male flower to the female flower. And so that's when you need to understand pollination. Um, so these would be things in the curcumin family, the squash, the watermelon, cucumbers, you know, for, there's many more, but for, you know, where carrots and peas are, you know, they're all in that family. These with the two houses, generally you see that with the fruit trees, or the, like say, peely nut, you mean male peely nut and female peely nut. Um, I think it was durian like that, you need a male tree, female tree, um, I think during maybe, uh, spinaches, that's one of the vegetable crops, it has actually a male plant that only produces uh, pollen, and a female plant that only produces the seed. So um, in those cases, you really have to think about pollinators, and our, we don't, Hawaii, it's interesting, and we don't have a lot of native pollinators. So one of our major pollinators, of course, is the honeybee. Um, we have the butterflies and moths, but they have scales. They don't have hairs like the honeybee. Flies um, actually are better pollinators than moths and butterflies because they have little hairs on their legs. And they are, you will see them on, especially a plant like a, uh, when carrot goes to seed or parsley goes to seed, or even cilantro, it's an umbilifer. It, um, you know, it has a, like an umbrella type shape, like dill. That's a good one to think of. And all the flowers on it. And they love those flowers. They love to go to those flowers. So you'll see a lot of flies on them. Um, thinking about our fruit trees, just to diverge for a second, um, cacao is midge pollinated. And the midges live in the debris that's under the cacao tree. So you really want to be aware of that. You, you don't want to be raking up all those leaves and putting them somewhere else because you're probably destroying that whole pollination cycle. Um, when you look at mango, mango seems to have a little hoverfly that pollinates. And so the interesting thing is to go out and, and watch your stuff. Like one year we just, we had tons of um, avocado flowers and no avocados. And so we stood out there and it was like, you know, we saw these little hoverflies, and then we saw mosquitoes on the flowers. And mosquitoes will pollinate, but again, they really don't have any structures on their body that are good at carrying pollen. So our honeybees are our biggest pollinators, and those are the ones uh, we want to think about. Not, not all plants 
are pollinated in that way. Some are wind pollinated, tomatoes, corn. Um, so, so how you plant those plants will determine how well they become pollinated. Corn, you really want to plant in big blocks. If you plant in a straight line, you've got to figure your wind is it's got to go down that line. Okay, go down that line. If it's in a big block, you're getting the wind everywhere. Um, bees will go to, uh, for the pollen on corn, so they will transfer um, the pollen to different corn plants. But, and so does wind. But the pollen of corn is very light, and um, excuse me, it's heavy, and it's very short-lived. So it tends to drop to the ground and only live a few hours, be viable. The pollen's only viable uh, for a few hours. So uh, if, we're, if we have corn on that list, we'll talk more about it. Um, the other thing that's really uh, neat, you need to think about just slightly when you source your, uh, you're going to grow something like, let's say you want to grow onions. We're probably in Hawaii not going to grow onion to seed because it's going to need a cold um, period that we don't have called fertilization. You can do it in your refrigerator, but this is a technique for pretty advanced um, people. And it's a pain. <laughs> I can tell you from experience. Um, so um, onions are um, short, they're, they're short day and long day crops. And what that means is some plants have photoreceptors where they actually can sense the daylight. And what they're actually sensing is not, even though they call them short day, long day, they're sensing the, the length of the night or the dark cycle. And um, they need, so what they'll do is they'll sense that and in one, they'll, they'll send up the vegetative growth at one time and the seed growth at another time during the photo period. In Hawaii, we have, um, we're so close to the equator that we have very little difference there. And so with onions, we, it, you really are not going to get an onion to go to the bulb shape uh, unless you get a short day crop, uh, a short day seed. So when you're looking for onion seed just to grow onions in your vegetable garden, just, just to be aware of you, look for short day varieties. Um, Radish is an interesting one. Radish, you have to, it is very sensitive to photo period, and it will make the root, which is what we all want, in, during the long uh, time of the year, which is the summer. So if you plant radish at the wrong time, you're not going to get the root. Um, if you look at lettuce, lettuce, when we get long days and hot days, um, it bolts. And so it goes to seed. So there, the, these plants are sensitive to light and to what stage in their vegetative or flowering cycle they're at. And then there's a lot of plants that they call day neutral. They, they really don't care. They'll grow all the time. Beans, tomatoes, corn, um, yeah, corn stay neutral. A number, most of our, our garden plants. The two you really want to watch for are, um, there's one more. <laughs> onion and um, the radish and are people familiar with shiso? So shiso is a, I think it's a Japanese crop. It's grown for the leaf. We use it a lot in pestos and um, salads. It has a really strong flavor. You can later on sample it. And in the summer it will not go to seed. So if you're growing this for leaf, which is what you want to grow it for, you want to grow it during the summertime. So there's a few little tricky things to be aware of. I don't know if you hear people talk about, well, when I plant a seed crop, I need a certain population size. What does that mean? Um, in general, it means that in order to get the genetic diversity that you want, the different types of pollination are going to kind of determine the, po uh, the population size. And there's a little handout that came with your little packet. And, it's, and it has kind of a graph that's, um, population size and isolation. But if you had 20 plants, that would be great. You'd have a lot of genetic diversity, right? But you could get away with you could get away with one. You could get away with five. That'd be better. Um, the reason you probably don't want to grow one is, first of all, you're not going to get all the genetic expression that you would in five or 20. 
because each of these plants, every seed that's grown on that one plant that has a sulfur is going to be genetically identical. So in other words, with um, beans that are sulfurs, if you um, are growing lima beans and it looks, your bean looks like this, on that plant, you're going to get the same bean on every pod that looks like this. It might be smaller or larger based on nutrition, but it's basically genetically identical. Based upon the space you have, how much energy you have, you know, you can pick your population size. And we're, we'll go through these crops. Do you want to talk about population size for these guys? For outcrossers? The outcrossers, you, uh, you need a um, larger population size because of the, you know, the genetic, the mo movement of the pollen is going to, you're going to need more plants to get that genetic diversity. There's some plants, and I'm not going to go into this, um, it can be for a later class time for all the seed ambassadors, but there's something called inbreeding depression. If you don't get enough pollen movement from the male to the female, um, you start to get lack of vigor in the plants. So you want to have, um, you know, in squashes, you could get away with a minimum of 20. Um, in corn, 100. Um, so it, it's, it varies. There, there's a really great book. So I'm going to talk about resources for a second here. If you're really into this, um, Susan Ashworth's Seed to Seed goes through every crop and tells you everything you need to know. It's a fabulous book. They're also on our website, and that it's on that little um, seed brochure. Uh, we have free downloads on that website from all different kinds of resources on seed saving. There's, you know, we're working on the website uh, to make it even better, but uh, right now there's some really great downloads that are free. And if you're a, t a school teacher, there's a really good one from Occidental Arts and Ecology, and they actually have curriculum based around seed saving. That's written on. Fedco? Fedco has a good yeah. uh, curriculum. And Fedco's in that list of downloads. So you can just go there, too, if you don't want to buy this book. So when you have outbreeders, when you have the in perfect flower and it's self pollinating, you know, isolate them from each other by very much distance. Um, the only one I would say is an exception is pepper, which is a sulfur, because it'll cross with hot peppers. And it only is because hot peppers are still very uh, representative of their wild state. And they have the male part kind of hangs down below the flower petals. And so bees can transfer the pollen from pepper to pepper. So I don't, because I grow a lot of sweet peppers and I save seed, I don't grow hot peppers. And I don't use a lot of hot peppers. And, so I just get them from somebody who throws them. So um, isolation um, distance in outcrossers can be huge. It can be up to a mile. Um, it depends what's happening. What's your neighbor growing? Say you're going to grow kombucha squash, and your neighbor is growing uh, another squash of a different, like the, that little company looking squash, but I don't know if I'm going to but a different squash, and you really want this type of squash, you don't want it crossed. So you're going to have to isolate it by about a mile, which is probably impossible if you're a neighbor. So there are little tricks that you can do. Um, you can hand pollinate them, and there's a whole chart that fell down over there that shows graphically how to do that. Um, when you look at squash flowers, Um, this this is the male flower. It has a long stem. It's not open yet. But um, also in cucumbers, it'll be kind of the same. It'll have a longer stem. But the telling part is the female flower always has this tiny little almost squash on there. This is from a pumpkin. And there, it's like a little baby pumpkin. That's actually the ovary. Um, and that's where the pollination needs to travel down into there and, and make that grow. Uh, cucumbers will have like little baby cucumber on the female flowers, so that's how you can tell male and female flowers. And a lot of people will say to me, um, 
I don't know, I planted these stuff, and I'm not, I'm not getting any squash. And I'm like, you know, what time of year did you plant them? Um, the males are opening, and there's no females, so, you know, the males aren't going to give you the squash. Uh, and so what will happen is that little ovary will try to develop, and it'll get about this far, and it'll turn yellow, and it'll drop off. And you'll say, oh, I, it got stung, uh, something happened. No, it didn't get pollinated. So when you see these little yellow kind of fall off, or this is from a pumpkin, so it's fairly large, but the cucumber will just turn all yellow and drop off. Uh, it doesn't really grow. That's because it wasn't pollinated. Um, so isolation, there's lots of tricks. People will cage certain plants and then uh, leave the, say I'm growing basil, two varieties of basil in a small garden next to each other. So I have a cage. Uh, I let those be pollinated openly, and then I flip the cage, and now I let these be pollinated openly. So they're not going to cross. So there are ways to do it in a small garden. This is something that we can go into uh, you know, at greater level of, uh, in, in more advanced conversation. When we talk about the different types of Yeah, when we talk about that. So, um, and then the last, well, not the last thing, but when you're going to see, you're, you're, um, you're going to be selecting all the time. Because when you plant that seed, that seed starts changing immediately based on being in your garden. Um, it's turning different genes off and on, how disease resistant it is based upon your conditions. So right from the get-go, you want to start selecting. You know, in your seedling tray, you have you know, real healthy looking ones and one that's kind of got a skinny stem and it's a little, it's out of there. Why, why, you know, why take the energy to try to grow that to seed? So you want to start selecting right at the seedling stage and then all through the growing time. Um, you want to leave enough plants. Like a lot of people say, well, you know, that's half my vegetables. Well, eat the ones that you don't want to save seed from, the ones that say you're growing tomatoes and you get some, when we get these wet, dry periods, they'll start cracking. You'll notice, have any, has anybody noticed that? And so, you know, those are the ones I eat. I eat those um, from that plant. And then I look for a plant that's not doing that because tomato is a sulfur. Um, and I, those are the ones I'm going to tag and I'm going to save seed from. And I'm going to, you know, we'll talk about how to save seed from those types of plants. Um, Plants that grow their seeds in the pulp, like tomatoes, squash, cucumbers, papaya, um, we use a wet process to extract them, and we're going to show that. Uh, and sometimes we ferment them. And we do that because some of these seeds, not all of them, but say cucumber, papaya, tomato, they have a little gel coat. I, if you notice when you take them out, there's a little gel coat around them, and that has to break down in order for it to, to germinate. And so we just want to speed that process up. What will happen is if it fell on the ground, it would sit there for quite a while, and then eventually the bacteria in the soil and whatever would eat that seed coat off and it will germinate. But it'll, you know, it'll stay there until that happens. So we do this fermentation process, and I'm going to show you that with um, some papaya seeds in order to, to extract the seeds from the wet seeded crops. Dry seeded are the ones we talked about. Um, the beans, you want to let them. If you can, you really want to let them get to this papery stage, you know, so they're really crackly and papery. Then they're most mature. Um, sometimes what happens, when we'll get a wet period, and it, you're going to have to watch your beans. It really depends on the variety. It doesn't happen with all the beans I've grown, but some varieties are more susceptible. And when they get wet, they'll start sprouting in the pod. And you've probably seen that. Lima beans, I think, do that quite a bit, um, especially the big Christmas lime on those type of beans. So what I do then is um, I collect those when they're just kind of all yellow, and then I bring them in the house to them so they don't sprout. So um, dry seeded. Uh, crops need to have to be dry. Lettuce, it needs to be dry. You need to either cover it, or like we said, dig it up and put it under your eaves. 
in order to save seed from it. Um, so a way to protect it. And okay, now we're going to ask you guys to tell us what crops you want to grow. Um, and you have your worksheets, so hopefully you'll follow along and you can use these later on to answer some questions you might have. So just shout out a, a crop that you want to grow to see. It's not clear whether they grow true from seed. Um, but the seed potatoes will, um, and that would be nice. so. Yeah, there's still the court is still out on whether that's the way to grow sweet potatoes from seed. Um, people are looking at that. So let's. I can't really speak to that. So that's sorry. Yeah, if you want to grow sweet potatoes true. You should yeah. yeah. Other things that are vegetatively propagated. Taro. They grow best from slips rather than Yeah, sugarcane, taro. Those, a lot of your canoe crops, because they've been 
propagated by cake for so long, they actually have lost the ability to make seed, or if they do make seed, it's not very viable. You know, but it'll, I've grown breadfruit from seed and um, the Samoan variety, and it, it got up about this high, and then it just went, eh, I don't think so. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, so the, the canoe crops, a lot of them are, are vegetated and propagated.